This is part two of the nuclear chemistry lecture, which covers topics 4.3.4 to 4.3.7. This presentation was developed based from the following references. Hopefully, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to describe nuclear fusion and fission reactions, use first order kinetics to examine the rates of nuclear decay, and be able to calculate the half-life of a radioisotope and the age of an object through radiochemical dating, and the remaining amount of a radioisotope given the appropriate data. Also, uh, lastly, understand nuclear reactors, explain how nuclear reactions can be used to produce energy, define critical mass and describe the relationship between critical mass and chain reactions, explain the functions of the major components of a nuclear reactor, fuel elements, control rods, moderator, and cooling liquid, and lastly, identify the primary and secondary loops in a boiler that is heated by a nuclear reactor. 4.3.4 Nuclear Fission and Fusion There are two types of nuclear reactions, nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. From the name itself, nuclear fusion is a process whereby very light nuclei join to form a heavier nucleus. Nuclear fission on the other hand, is a process whereby a heavy atomic nucleus splits into two lighter fragments. Both these processes are known to release large amounts of energy. The diagram on the left side is an example of a fusion reaction where a deuterium nucleus and a tritium nucleus collide at high speeds to fuse into a heavier nucleus, releasing 340 billion kilojoules of energy per kilogram. This forms an alpha particle and releases a neutron. The right-hand side is an example of a fission reaction, where a heavy uranium-235 nucleus comes into contact with a neutron, causing it to split into lighter nuclei rubidium-90 and cesium-143, along with some high-speed neutrons. This process releases 88 billion kilojoules of energy per kilogram an order of magnitude smaller than fusion. Because nuclear fusion reactions release large amounts of energy, they are considered exothermic processes. The same is true for nuclear fission. Due to the tendency of nuclear fission reactions to generate several fast-moving neutrons, these neutrons could potentially collide with other heavy nuclei thereby triggering a chain of nuclear reactions. Large amounts of energy are released in the process, and this energy can be quantified using Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared, where E is the energy, m is the mass lost during each reaction, and c is the speed of flight in a vacuum. 4.3.5 Radioactive Decay Kinetics and chemistry involves the study of the rates of reactions. If you recall from the previous lectures, radioactive decay is the process in which an unstable nuclei emits charged particles and energy, thereby causing it to decrease mass. The rate of decay is the negative of the change in the amount of nucleides per unit time. First order kinetics means that this rate is dependent on the amount of substance currently present, meaning the more the decay progresses, the slower the rate becomes. The exponential relationship between the decay rates at an, in, at an initial time and after a certain time is related by these equations, where A sub O is the amount at the start, A is the amount after time t, and K is the reaction constant. A similar equation can also be used, but using decay rates, where N is expressed as the number of disintegrations per unit time. Because radioactive decay is exponential, it is typically measured in terms of half-life. This is the amount of time it takes for half of the mass to be lost. The right-hand image is a graphical representation of the decay of strontium-90 with a half-life of 28.8 years. Here, each cell in the grid represents a certain mass. From fully shaded, it takes 28.8 years to decay half the initial amount. Then, after another 28.8 years, 
half of the previous amount decays, and so on. The table on the left shows the half-lives of other radioactive nuclides. Half-life is expressed uh, by this equation, to t one half, being the half-life, is equal to the natural logarithm of two divided by k, which, which is the reaction constant. This reaction constant is unique to every reaction. What this equation tells us is that the substance with a high k value will have a shorter half-life, which means that they decay faster. Conversely, lower k values represent longer half-lives. Radioactive decay can be quantified by the decay rate, which is defined as the number of disintegrations per unit time. The SI unit of decay is the Becquerel, or BQ, defined as the disintegrations per second. It can also be measured in terms of Curie, or CI, defined as the number of nuclei disintegrating each second in 1 gram of radium-226, equivalent to 3.70 times 10 raised to 10 disintegrations per second. This graph shows a timeline of the decay of carbon-14. The y-axis represents the number of carbon-14 nuclei, and the x-axis represents time in years. As you can see here, it takes 5,730 years for half the initial amount of carbon-14 to decay. After another 5,730 years, half of that remaining half, or one-fourth of the initial amount, decays, and so on. We can describe this decay mathematically with this equation. The number of nuclei at any time t is equal to the initial number of nuclei times one-half raised to n, where n is the number of half-lives elapsed. This table shows the decay constant, or k values, and half-life values of some beryllium isotopes. As you can see here, the isotope with the largest k value has the shortest half-life, almost a quintillionth of a second. The one with the smallest k value has a half-life of almost 2 million years. To apply our understanding of the lesson, let's try and solve this sample problem. Strontium-90 is a radioactive byproduct of nuclear reactors that behaves biologically like calcium, the element above it in group 2A. When strontium-90 is ingested by mammals, it is found in their milk and eventually in the bones of those drinking the milk. If a sample of strontium-90 has an activity of 1.2 times 10 raised to 12 disintegrations per second, what are the activity and the fraction of nuclei that have decayed after 59 years? The half-life of strontium-90 is 29 years. The equations at our disposal that can help us solve the problem are the equations expressing half-life, which is t one half or half-life is equal to the natural logarithm of 2 divided by k or the reaction constant. Another equation at our disposal is the ln of the ratio of the initial disintegration rate and the disintegration rate at any time is equal to the reaction constant k times the time elapsed. We know the disintegration rate at the initial time. And we are asked to find the activity or the disint disintegration rate after 59 years. We can use the second equation to find that value. However, first we need to figure out what is k. Now, to find k, we can use equation 1 because we know the half-life of strontium-90. Now, the first strategy here is to find k. We can relate k using the first equation and k is equal to the natural logarithm of 2 divided by the half-life. And we know that the half-life of strontium-90 is 29 years. Now, because we know the, half, the, the k value, we can then use equation 2 to solve for the activity after 59 years. We can rearrange equation number 2 to express n in terms of the other variables. We can do that by raising e by the expressions in both sides of the equation, meaning e raised to ln of no divided by n should be equal to e raised to kt. Doing this, 
it removes the natural logarithm on the left side and we will be left with n sub o divided by n is equal to e raised to kt and we can express n in terms of the other variables and we will get n is equal to n sub o e raised to negative kt because we know n o which is 1.2 times 10 raised to 12 these integrations per second we know k and we know t 59 years we can solve for n therefore n is equal to 1.2 times 10 raised to 12 this integration per second e raised to negative natural logarithm of 2 divided by 29 years times 59 years we will get 2.9 times 10 raised to 11 disintegrations per second. To get the fraction of nuclei that have decayed after 59 years, we can assume an initial number of nuclei of 100 as an arbitrary value. Now, you can use any value, but I prefer to use 100. So if I have 100 initial nuclei, I can use the second equation to find how many nuclei will be left after 59 years. Since we already know k, we can very easily solve for that value. So we can use this the same equation but replace it with the variable a. So a after 59 years is simply equal to the initial number of nuclei times e raised to negative kt. And because we assumed an a an initial a value of 100 we can use that in the equation times e raised to negative the ln of 2 divided by 29 years which represents k times 59 years we will get 24 nuclei and so the fraction remaining is simply equal to the initial 100 minus the remaining or sorry the fraction of nuclei that have decay is equal to 100 minus 24 divided by the initial and this this should be 0 0.76 alternatively you can simply use the disintegration rates to get this fraction now this fraction should also be equal to the initial disintegration rate of 1.2 times 10 raised to 12 minus the final disintegration rate of 2.9 times 10 raised to 11 all over the initial disintegration rate and this should also be equal to 0 0.76 application carbon dating Radiometric dating is the method of dating objects based on their isotopes and the isotope abundances. Knowing the half-life of certain isotopes, we can use this as a kind of nuclear clock to determine the ages of different objects by comparing the relative abundances of each isotope in the current sample. The most commonly used isotope is carbon-14, which is naturally generated in the atmosphere through the reaction shown. Radiometric dating involving carbon-14 relies on the fact that carbon-14 naturally generated in the atmosphere are absorbed by plants and distributed across the food web. This means that all living organisms have traces of carbon-14. The proportions of carbon-14 relative to other isotopes in samples can then be used to determine the age of organic materials. The approximate age of the Earth was determined using the same method, but using a different substance, specifically uranium-238, which has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. To apply our understanding of radiocarbon dating, let's solve this example problem. The charred bones of a sloth in a cave in Chile represent the earliest evidence of human presence in the southern tip of South America. A sample of the bone has a specific activity 
of 5.22 disintegrations per minute per gram of carbon. If the carbon 12 to 14 ratio for living organisms results in a specific activity of 15.3 disintegrations per minute per gram, how old are the bones? The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. The equations at our disposal to help us solve this problem are the equation for half-life, which is T, one-half, or the half-life, is equal to the natural logarithm of 2 divided by the reaction constant K. Another equation is that the ratio of the natural logarithm of an initial disintegration rate or decay rate and a decay rate at a certain time is equal to the reaction constant times the time elapsed from the initial disintegration rate. Now, we know that the initial disintegration rate for when the slot were still alive should have been 15.3 disintegrations per minute per gram. And then we also know that after a certain number of years, the current disintegration rate of the bones, the organic material in the bones, is down to 5.22 disintegrations per minute per gram. We can determine the age of the bones by using the second equation and, and solving for T, given the initial and final disintegration rate. But in order to do that, we need first to know K. And similar to the previous problem that we solved, we can get K by using the first equation and knowing the half-life of carbon-14. So that will be our strategy. Now K can be determined by taking ln of 2 and dividing it by the half-life of carbon-14, which is 5,730 years. So now that we know K, we can simply solve for T using the second equation. So T is simply equal to the ln of the initial disintegration rate divided by the final disintegration rate all over the reaction constant. Since we know both decay rates, we can say that the ln of 15.3 disintegrations per minute per gram divided by 5.22 disintegration per minute per gram all over ln of 2 over 5730 years which is which represents the this uh, reaction constant and so the age of the bones should be 8900 years Application. Nuclear reactors. Nuclear energy is perhaps one of the most widely known applications of nuclear chemistry. Today, all nuclear power plants are powered by nuclear fission. Nuclear fission essentially is the splitting of heavy nuclei into smaller ones, generating enormous amounts of energy in the process. The other type of nuclear reaction, nuclear fusion, generates more energy but is a techno it's technologically still under development to this day. Apart from energy generation, nuclear weapons also rely on nuclear fission as its source of destructive energy. Nuclear fission react reactions involve chain reactions where each subsequent fission reaction is triggered by neutrons generated by initial reactions. On average, two fast-moving neutrons are generated per fission reaction, which could initialize two other fission reactions and so on, thereby creating a chain of reactions. Often, these fission reactions can occur rapidly, thereby generating enormous amounts of energy within a short period of time, resulting in violent explosions. Under controlled condition, however, the energy generated from these violent reactions can be used to generate useful energy, like in modern fission nuclear power plants today. At the core of these power plants are the nuclear reactors that house the fission reactions occurring. These reactions are controlled by control rods 
that limit the number of neutrons colliding with the fuel rods containing the heavy nuclei. The temperature of the reactor is controlled by circulating cooling fluid through it continuously. The heat generated is used to convert water into steam, which can be used to turn turbines to generate electricity. Despite the promise of nuclear energy, its use is still a source of controversy and debate to this day. One of the clear benefits of nuclear fission energy is that it does not produce greenhouse gases, which today is a big concern due to climate change. They also generate relatively large amounts of energy and are also cheap to operate. However, like fossil fuels, the fuel source for fission nuclear power plants are non-renewable. Although they do not generate greenhouse gases, they do generate toxic nuclear waste that must be carefully contained and kept for thousands of years. Famous nuclear disasters in history, like the Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima disasters, do not really contrib contribute positively to the public opinion on the use of power plants. Lastly, although they are cheap to operate, they are quite expensive to build today. This diagram shows a typical fission nuclear reactor design. Housed in a containment structure is the nuclear reactor chamber, where water is continuously pumped inside to collect the heat generated and at the same time cool the reactor. This is the primary loop. The superheated fluid is then allowed to exchange heat with water in a separate loop called the secondary loop, which is converted to steam and allowed to drive a turbine to generate electricity. The excess steam is cooled by cooling water, and the excess heat is released in large cooling towers, which are iconic structures that define all fission nuclear reactors today. And that ends our discussion on nuclear chemistry. I hope you learned something today, and good luck!